Hi, welcome, welcome to the RightsCon rights session. Uh, will democracy survive national security in a digital space of Southeast Asia? So uh, I'm just getting a feedback, just hang on a sec. Okay. So will democracy survive in the, uh, the national security trends in the digital space of Southeast Asia? This is the, uh, I think the only Southeast Asian uh, specific session in all of RightsCon. So we're gonna make it very intense. We've got 10 countries to cover. We've got some amazing speakers to speak and they're going to try and encapsulate in five minutes, some country situations. Obviously, this is only a tasting menu because uh, most of you know that Southeast Asian food is very good, mm -hmm. um, but the politics is even better. Um, but we are hoping that uh, people who join us on this session will be interested enough to come back to us with more requests for more in-depth discussions. So this is your little degustation of national security in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, firstly, I, first up, I have to do um, um, acknowledgement to Manushia Foundation and Penn International for being co-organizers of this session. And as is usual, I often forget to introduce myself. So I am your immoderate moderator, Debbie Stothard, um, and I will be with you in uh, for the next hour, trying to get everyone on time. So please start asking your questions now, because we've made space to interact. First up, I'm going to ask Emily Pradichit, founder and director, executive director of Manushia Foundation. And for those of you who know sound Sanskrit, Manushia means human. And she's going to explain to you why we're here very briefly. And um, Emily, besides being the founder and executive director of Manushia Foundation, is a refugee from Laos who um, was settled in France and then came back to us in Southeast Asia. So we're very happy that she's here, that she um, helped organize uh, and co-host the session. So over to you, Emily. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Didi. So we are very happy to be at RightsCon 2020. This is the only session focusing only on Southeast Asia. So we are very happy to organize it with Penn International. And we felt that like it was very important to have leading voices from the region to talk about what is happening in Southeast Asia, the rise of digital dictatorship. Last year, when we were at RightsCon 2019 in Tunis, there was a lack of representation from Southeast Asian voices. There were a panel on shutdown with Myanmar, but there was no speaker from Burma. So it was really important for us this year to show, but also to share with everybody globally the situation in Southeast Asia. That's why we are very happy to have amazing speakers. We have uh, human rights activists leading voices from the region who are working hard on digital rights on the ground, will be sharing with us uh, the context in Southeast Asian countries. So we are very, that's, the, that's the main reason why we are here, because there's a need to talk about the rise of digital dictatorship in Southeast Asia. And there is a real need for all of us to join forces and share with everybody what is happening in our region and also brainstorm on how we could work together further. Thanks, Emily. Um, aren't you supposed to be speaking also on Thailand and Laos? Yeah. Okay, so we bring it back, Emily, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the situation in Laos, which most people overlook, and Thailand, and then we're going to move on to the, the next few countries. Thank you, Debbie. So to, to start the session, yes, it was important for us to, to talk about Laos, which is a country that few people are actually looking at and which is one of the most uh, critical countries when it comes to the shrinking of civic space. Because in Laos, there's no civic space at all. There's no existence of civil society at all. So it's really important for us to provide you the what is happening in Laos. As you know, Laos is a one-state party led by the Lao People's Revolutionary Party. And what is happening in Laos is that there's a real absence of civic space and netizens and citizens are not allowed to share their opinions. And there's a, there's a, 
a lot of laws that have been put in place to crack down on dissidents, to crack down on any critics. And there's an environment of fear and, um, among civil society, among activists. So the na national security in Laos is being used to keep the one party in power and is being used by the Lao government to scare civil society, to scare any citizen to speak. So first, I would like to, to share with you an emblematic case, which is a really recent case of a woman human rights defender, and her name is Wei Hong Sayabuli, and we call her Mwe. She's a, she's a young woman human rights defender who has been sharing her opinion about uh, the negative impact of development project uh, and the, ne the negative impact of corruption and also the lack of proper community consultation and proper environmental impact assessment when it comes to development projects in Laos. So this is Mwe, and Mwe, Mwe is now in jail. She's serving a five years sentence in jail for speaking out against the Lao government. She left behind a five-year-old daughter. And the, the, what is very problematic in Laos is that the government is using Article 117 of the Penal Code, which targets propaganda against the Lao government, against Laos, as a way to crack down on civil society, as a way to crack down on any critics. So Mwe is now serving the, the highest in, um, sentence under this law, which is five years. And what we are doing to support her case is we sent a complaint with the United Nations and we hope that a communication will be sent soon to the Lao government because we want her to be released from jail and we want her to be able to go back to her family, to go back to her daughter, expressing her views on how the Lao government is not supporting its own population and how the Lao government is letting people affected by a negative development project, affected by displacement, just sharing her views should not be uh, punished. Just because she did la Facebook live videos should not be punished. There are also other laws in Laos that are being used to create an environment of fear and censorship against Lao citizens. There's the law on prevention and combating cybercrime, which prevents uh, cybercrimes against national security, which is meant to protect national security. And there's also the Decree 327 on internet-based information control and management, which is by sharing of, of information believed to be a threat to national security. More recently, uh, when it came to uh, the impact of COVID-19, there is a uh, Lao migrant workers who left Thailand to go back to Laos and who were not being informed on any quarantine system once entering Laos and who were not informed on any procedures that they had to follow in, in order to go back to Laos. The second they entered Laos, they were put in quarantine, but they were put in, in schools without any beds in very bad conditions. So a, a Lao migrant worker denounced how they were being treated on the Facebook Live, and then he was arrested. Again, because of, uh, of, uh, of sharing information and how the Lao government is treating, was treating them. So in Laos now, there, there is a real crackdown on people who are using Facebook, mainly Facebook, because Lao people mainly use Facebook. They don't use Instagram or Twitter. They share information on Facebook. Um, and there's a real crackdown on those who dare speaking out against the government. There's a famous Lao activist who had to flee Laos in August 2018 after he, after he criticized corruption and again, how the Lao government did not respond effectively to the Lao Dem collapse that happened on 20 July 2018. His name is Joseph Akaravong. He had to flee Laos and now we don't, nobody knows where he is and he's not using Facebook anymore and he has to live uh, hidden in order to protect himself just because he did Facebook lives uh, about the Lao Dem collapse and to criticize how the government was badly handling the situation. So this is for, this is for Laos and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to, to Thailand. So, in Thailand, national security has been heavily used uh, to weaponize and to go after uh, critics. And the, the law that has been the most used in Thailand is the Computer Crime Act, which is meant to address cyber crimes. So the, the first law that I'm going to address is this law because it has been in place for a long time and it has been heavily used by the government. And specifically, is the Section 14 of the Computer Crime Act that is being used to go after activists and human rights defenders. And they are being arrested, charged, and put in jail. Uh, just because they are sharing, they are posting on Facebook or they are tweeting about situations, be it against the, be it, be, be it criticizing the monarchy or the military government, or even sharing information on development projects or against businesses. So what is happening with the Computer Crime Act is that 
for a post or a tweet, you can you can go up to five years in jail. So if you share, for example, if you do eight tweets, you can go up to four years in jail, which is crazy on how the the, the Thai government is actually weaponizing the Computer Crime Act. Um, the Computer Crime Act is also is also going after internet providers. So it also punishes internet providers with the same penalty if they are being seen as supporting internet users, criticizing the monarchy or the military government. And it also forces internet service providers to store users' data for 90 days to allow the person to be identified. So as you can see, when it comes to the Computer Crime Act, the, the UNGP is pillar number two, which is meant to... Uh, asking the, the private sector to respect human rights cannot be enforced in Thailand because they are being asked to support the government and assist the government in surveilling and storing data. The second uh, point that I would like to address in Thailand is the anti-fake news center that was put in place in November 2019, which is a very, very uh, problematic center because it's basically a center that is being weaponized again to protect the government, to protect national security and to go after Dissident. The center focuses on monitoring the internet and false information, including any critics against government policies and any threat to uh, to national order, national security. Uh, the 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 anti fake news center also forces internet service providers to correct the information online, and also has put in place a website where they go after any false information against the government to correct the information. Um, the third problematic law that I would like to speak uh, in Thailand is the, is the 2019 Cybersecurity Act. And it's a very problematic law because it's being, uh, cybersecurity is being interpreted as national security. So as you can see, it's not being human-centered. Cybersecurity is meant to, to protect us. It's meant to protect users against, against cyber threats. But in the case of Thailand, but also it's growing in Southeast Asia, all the cybersecurity laws that we are seeing also in Vietnam and in other countries are meant to protect governments. So they are not human-centered and they are not enshrined in human rights principles. And through the, the, cyber, the Cyber Security Act, the government is allowed to collect information if they, are, if they believe there is a cyber threat. There's no precise defini definition of what is national security. There's no precise definition of what constitutes a cyber threat or the different levels of cyber threats. So people can be arrested if, even without um, any judicial oversight. So it's a very, very problematic, laws, uh, problematic law because it gives full power to the government with a committee that is being created under the Cybersecurity Act to monitor and implement the act. Um, the Data Protection Act of Thailand is also very problematic because it's meant to protect our data. But there is a section four under the Data Protection Act that, sh that actually allows violations to our privacy to protect state security and national security and in case of cyber security, cyber threats. So the, the Data Protection Act was meant to be uh, in place this year, but because of COVID-19, the implementation will start in May 2021. So as of today, our data is not protected in Thailand. And when it came to COVID-19, that's my last point for, for, for Thailand, when it comes to COVID-19, so the government enacted emergency decree, and we are still living under the emergency decree that has been extended, extended until the end of August. Uh, it just gives the military government more power to do whatever it wants and to go after uh, dissidents and critics of the government. Um, in March 2020, there's a Thai artist that was coming back home from Spain, and uh, his name is Danai Usama, and he criticized the way that people were being screened at Subanapum Airport. There was no proper uh, there was no proper process to screen people, so he was just sharing again on Facebook through a Facebook post how the government was not well responding to the COVID-19 pandemic at the airport. He was arrested because he was detained with, with other people. He was not put in quarantine um, and he was arrested just because he did a Facebook post about the way that the Thai government did not properly screen people at the, at, at the main and part of in Bangkok. So as, you, as we can see, um, more recently, there's a real rise of digital dictatorship COVID-19 now is being used to pass emergency decree to arrest people who are criticizing the government on how governments are handling uh, the pandemic. Before that, Thailand has put a array of laws, as we can see, the Cyber Security Act, the Anti-Fake News Center, to, even, to implement even more the Computer, the Computer Crime Act. And in Laos, we can see the penal code that is being used against human rights defenders. So in these two countries, we see the trend, the, the, the trend going after human rights defenders the trend of restricting our online freedom 
the trend of violating our privacy by putting pressure on tech companies to assist government to surveil netizen to store information. So there's a real need for for data privacy. There's a real need for data protection and the right to privacy to be respected. There's a real need to have digital rights respected by all parties, government, but also private sector to actually protect our data and our right to privacy. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Emily. Wow. So that was five minutes for Laos and five minutes for Thailand. Um, speaking of one party state in Laos, uh, recent developments in the past year has seen basically the dismantling of opposition parties and what would looks like effectively a one party state in Cambodia. Um, uh, we have with us Sophia Cha, our young achiever, our baby. <laughs> Um, no, we're really excited because um, to have um, young presenters on, on this panel. Sopiab is the executive director of the Cambodian Center for Human Rights. And despite being young and still looking youthful, she spent a huge number of her adult growth working for human rights in Cambodia. So, Sopia, what we've seen in Cambodia is a dismantling attacks on independent media, uh, attempts to dismantle opposition parties, um, outlawing of opposition leaders, and, and now under COVID. Um, has that gotten worse? Are we heading towards digital dictatorship in Cambodia as well? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, um, everyone, and uh, thank you so much. I think you speak all <laughs> of the issue earlier, <laughs> but let me uh, come back, um, you know, from a regional perspective that's there by Emily earlier um, for Cambodia. Um, probably um, we are not alone in the region to face a hurdle uh, lately, and uh, somehow within these two years, Cambodia have experienced um, a, a quite um, not 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 even a shrinking but a closing civic space, and a number of key challenges that we have been experienced so far, um, especially affecting a lot on the civil society operation. Um, one looking at the legal framework that um, there have been a number of legislation that the government have employed either the existing or amendment on the existing law as well as the new introduction of um, restrictive law that um, having a chilling effect on um, uh, fundamental freedom and, and, and especially the freedom of expression. Um, but also, um, you know, all those Cambodia have been quite relatively free when it comes to the internet freedom. Uh, within this few years, we witnessed a decline as well. So that was because of a introduction of certain re uh, restrictive laws, such as the telecommunication law, the social media broadcast or regulation that, that have a effect on the way that people can communicate online. For example, you can be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, liable uh, even you just click like or share certain posts. <laughs> and um, recently, um, because of the COVID-19, Cambodia have followed suit with other regional um, countries um, by introducing the law on the management of the nation um, in the state of emergency. And this law, although uh, in Cambodia we have not yet declared it, but looking at the law itself, if it would be imposed, it gives quite excessive power to the government um, to restrict um, the freedom of expression, um, the freedom of uh, the press as well. And um, in addition to that, um, in this past few years, the government have come up with a number of amendments, especially to the criminal court. And that is very critical, is the less majestic provision. <laughs> Within the past, we know a lot that this provision have been applied in Thailand a lot, again, journalists, again, citizen, but um, Cambodia um, have introduced this and there have been case brought again individual already with the less majestic provision. 
um, an existing um, uh, co- uh, criminal code like defamation or incitement have been quite frequently used, um, particularly, uh, particularly again the online space. Um, this is existing law, but somehow there are some uh, pending law that the government intend to introduce as well, like the draft cybercrime law. And in, and when we say uh, cybercrime law, I think in the region be quite aware how how it will affect um, the freedom of expression, especially the online um, uh, expression. And um, somehow um, the good news, those out of this dark side, I think recently the the, the government have um, mentioned that they they would not introduce the fact new. <laughs> with with somehow a, a positive step, but we um, beside this, the government intend to introduce a quite alarming law as well. It's called public order law. That recently we try to analyze it. It it will have a very chilling effect mm, beyond the expression or you know kind of using the public space affecting the freedom of assembly, but even affecting on gender because. One of the articles suggesting that women um, should not wear two sword. <laughs> what what two sword mean, you know? So that is um, the legislation side. But um, even um, I mentioned all of this law, um, especially the pending law that have not been introduced. We have witnessed already the increased um, cases, arrests arrest or conviction against online uh, citizen. Um, there have been um, um, uh, cases that we documented recently. Um, um, we have just uh, launched our first annual report on the fundamental freedom monitor um, that we captured from April 2019 to um, uh, March 2020. And we have document um, roughly uh, 100 re- restrictions related to the freedom of expression. And among these cases, nearly half of, of them are related to the um, uh, online expression. And that is killing because um, among that, we can witness uh, around 48 individuals that have been uh, brought again, um, them because of the way that they exercise um, online. And um, we, we also conduct a sur- survey within this um, report coverage, and we found out the decline percentage of public who report feeling free to speak openly on social media. And um, this is our first year report, but we track, um, if we see the trend from year two, year three, and up to year four, the percentage have been decreased from 55% in year two and year three, 37%. And, and, and on the fourth year, it just 29% that people express that they feel free to speak openly on social media. So you can imagine how how high percentage of people who now, um, you know, um, ex, um, uh, have imposed their own self-censorship. Um, and with, with this case, I want to raise uh, one illustrious case that happened um, uh, during the COVID time as well, is the case again, a journalist. Um, uh, he um, he's the publisher for TV Facebook. Um, he was accused of um, incitement because he exactly quote the prime minister uh, statement who suggesting to the motor taxi driver to sell his motorbike in order to survive during COVID time. And the man exactly quote the prime minister statement, but in return he was mm. accused of incitement because. It, it was suggesting that he brought out of the context. So um, this is just one example out of other cases that um, people have been monitored, people have been accused or convicted simply because they express their opinion online. Um, and we have witnessed a number of um, uh, uh, a crackdown on journalists um, within the year that we, we, we have monitored at least 25 incidents that affect the journalists um, uh, or media outlay, you know, because they exercise their um, role as a journalist to cover the, the case. And, 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 and during the COVID pandemic, um, there have been increased um, restriction and violation, again, freedom of expression. We have documented um, 
about 26 incidents that have happening um, with the, um, um, the the restriction related to COVID-19. And uh, this number um, saw be right or increase as well because the report coverage is just um, by March 2020 and COVID time start very um, alarming um, in March. So uh, the, the, the case that I mentioned earlier would be um, more and, and mostly the, the, the charge again, um, citizen, um, online citizen is the fake news accusation. Well, um, so with this, um, I, I think Cambodia is not alone, as I said, it is quite common in the region, um, especially during the COVID time. It also gives certain justification for restrictive government to come up with a lot of measures um, that have, have brought a blur line between um, the public health and the you know restriction and violation on the fundamental freedom. Therefore, I would join with our panelists to appeal to um, our government um, as, and also the regional government to revoke or you know um, uh, significantly um, up, uh, um, amend the problematic legislation. Um, uh, and and also I think importantly is the decriminalization of the defamation and and other penal code that um, have a chilling effect on freedom of expression and finally is the uh, stop harassment judicial harassment again uh, human rights defenders journalists and um, you know other decent voice and um, I I believe that only with the protection and promotion of this freedom can bring about. Um, development, sustainable development. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, and that was, I think most of us will start to see these trends. When we talk about digital dictatorship, it's not, ex it's not confined within specific boundaries of one country. We're starting to see a regional trend. And moving from uh, Indochina, we're going to ask uh, Ananya Ramani, the uh, Human Rights and Advocacy Coordinator of Manusha Foundation to give us a very brief look at what's happening in the Philippines and Singapore. Thank you so much, Betty. So um, I'm covering two very um, interesting but disturbing situations in Philippines and Singapore. I think both of the countries, as we would have seen, they're very well covered in the media, what's been happening there. So I would first like to start with Philippines. So in the Philippines as a trend, we can see there's been a sharp downturn with a political regime that completely runs the country with like with a nine fist. So any criticism against the president or the government, as we've noticed, has been often met with um, verbal abuse or sometimes even physical threats against people. And at the same time, the law also has been weaponized along with these verbal abuse and physical threats to go to actually act upon and harass um, critics of the government or even common netizens. So in the case of Philippines, um, what I would like to start with is the most well-covered story um, of Rappler and the cyber libel case against um, a former Rappler journalist, Renaldo Santos Jr. and Rappler editor Maria Ressa. Um, so this, in this case, um, just to provide you with a background, uh, they were charged for cyber libel basically on a story where they accused a businessman of being connected with illegal drugs, human trafficking, but also having connections with a judge. Um, what is very interesting in this case is the story was shared um, in 2012 on the Rattler website. Um, sorry, prior to 2012 on the Rattler website, this was before the Cybercrime Act under which they were charged came into force. So technically they couldn't have been charged under this law. But in 2014, they just corrected a small typo in the article. And so using that, uh, charges were filed against them and they were convicted for cyber libel. So as you can see, this, this law just to prevent cyber crime is completely being weaponized against independent media in the country 
so that there's no access to information on the human rights violations that are actually taking place. So this is one of the most used laws. Another very disturbing example of how independent media is being attacked in the country was the recent case of a 25-year-old media network called ABS CBN. Um, they were refused the renewal of their license. Um, and most, they have been threatened in the past by the president saying he would go after them because they've been a long-time critic of the violent anti-drug campaign that's been going um, on in his country. And just to give you um, an idea of the impact, just last year, 20,000 people uh, were depended on ABS CBN either through their jobs or as private on private contracts to get money. So that's 20,000 people whose livelihood would be affected um, because of this cancellation. Additionally, um, I think most of us have seen something that's very well covered in the news has been the Anti-Terrorism Act that became law in Philippines earlier this month. So that law, again, is very dangerous and it's believed that it could be used against government critics because it has a very broad definition of what could be punished as terrorism. Um, also, it allows arrest and detention of anyone they suspect for 24 days without a, an arrest warrant at all. And it also allows surveillance through wiretapping for about 90 days. And there's also no accountability under this act for any action taken because all decisions are made by a single body of government officials called the Anti-Terror Council. So what has also happened is during the COVID-19 pandemic, now you can see there's a recurring trend in the region. During the COVID-19 pandemic in Philippines, um, a government order was passed specifically for the National Bureau of Investigation in Philippines to investigate cases on COVID-19 related fake news. But what is fake news has actually not been defined in any law in the Philippines. And what also has happened is several people were arrested under using basically using this power, but only those who were critical of the president or the government's COVID-19 response, only they were punished. And only action is only being taken against them, which clearly shows the intent of the law. So this is this shows like the, the rising digital dictatorship in the region. And I would now like to move on from Philippines to Singapore to give um, a bit of perspective on Singapore as well. So in Singapore, um, for long, the People's Action Party has built this image of uh, the country being one where economic success is the most important thing. And it's something only the, only the leaders of the People's Action Party can guarantee. And they use this whole idea as a basis to close any public space for discussion in the country, or they don't allow any alternative view to be expressed at all. So in Singapore, how they do this using the law, they do it in two ways. Um, one, they use the cybersecurity law, just like in Thailand. And the second is they also say they're taking action on what they label as fake news. Again, an emerging trend in the region. So just like in Thailand and Singapore, they, they say a cyber threat is something that's a threat to national security. And it allows government officials to basically take your hard disk from your computer or make a copy of the hard disk also to determine if there is a cyber threat. And um, so this is one fake news. So to actually go after this information um, in October of last year, there was a new law that was adopted in Singapore for the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act, or also known as POFMA. So um, what this act does, what this law does, is it, it doesn't allow the sharing of information which they think is harmful to the security of Singapore, but also any information that will reduce the confidence of people in the government. But that 
that's strange because the thing is the whole um, right to question government actions and hold them accountable is the basis of a democracy, which it would seem that this act doesn't allow. Um, so additionally, this law is also meant to target false and misleading information. But what is false and misleading? The law doesn't define and it also goes, it can go after information you also share in a private chat with a friend or even on a, on just a, mess, um, a social media group you form. So it also violates the online privacy of individuals in the country. Additionally, also the only, um, the government is allowed to use this act. So if there's actually any false or misleading information shared by the government, people can't use this law at all. And um, Mostly what happens is if information is believed to be false or misleading, um, the authorities will issue something called an order to correct or remove the information. They can even ask internet service providers or social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter to also correct or block access to this content. So that also proves dangerous because they are also forcing in internet service providers and tech companies to take action against information private citizens would share online. The other big challenge is that this law, um, it specifically states that it's only supposed to target um, false facts. So it, what was mentioned is it wouldn't target any opinions, criticisms, any satire or even a parody. Um, but in reality, what's happening is even opinions and criticisms are being punished using this law. So just to give you a quick perspective, um, from when the law came into force in October till now, there have been more than 70 cases, um, separate cases where um, they've issued POFMA orders. And as examples, uh, for instance, there was a POFMA order issued against um, an independent website, New Narrative and its founder, where they pointed out the flaws in the POFMA law and that it wouldn't allow criticism of the government. There have been many other POFMA orders issued on the same basis. And there have also been POFMA orders issued where people have criticized the government's response to COVID-19. And um, there's also been four POFMA orders issued when people were just estimating what the salary of the prime minister's wife in Singapore could be. So there's a lot of, like a whole variation of information that this law targets. But clearly, clearly I'm going to have to cut you off, uh, Anna. Yeah, yeah. We're running really short of time. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. okay. So thank you for that very quick uh, snapshot of the situation in Philippines and in Singapore. Um, now, we are going to the next speaker, who's actually the only man on our panel. Wahyudi Jaffa is the Deputy Director of Research with the Institute for Policy and Research and Advocacy, El Sam, in Indonesia. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that we have 20 minutes left and we do need some time for questions and we have Dr. Matida coming up. So over to you, Wahyudi. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the stage where I'm going to jump on you if you pass your time limit. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Debbie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for uh, having me, uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Yeah, I will give the uh, short uh, uh, update from the Indonesian situation uh, compared with the other Asian countries. And uh, based on our observation about the uh, Indonesian situation amid the political dynamic in the region, which tends to use digital authoritarian perspective, uh, compare with the uh, other ASEAN countries, Indonesia actually tends to be behind others in the establishment of policy or the establishment of legislation to respond to the use of information and communication uh, technology. Why is it behind? Uh, because the first reference of the law, which specifically regulates internet in Indonesia, is Electronic Information and Transaction Law, uh, enacted in 2008. It is uh, very earlier, uh, 
compare uh, with uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, and Thailand, which are earlier in establishing the similar law. For example, uh, uh, Malaysia have the Malaysian uh, Multimedia Act on 1998, uh, Thailand with the Cyber, uh, sorry, with the Computer Crime Act in uh, 1997, etc. Uh, the issuance of electronic information and transaction law also shows an anomaly compared to the other legislation on the freedom guarantee after the reform on 1998. Uh, other laws uh, such as press law, broadcasting law, public information law, even though uh, telecommunication law, all emphasize on the core regulation governance approach in which government is not dominant in the process of the implementation of the law. It is different from IDA law, which positions government as the only authority which regulates internet in Indonesia. Another problem of the IDA law is that it controls too many topics or one for all, one, uh, for all laws, as we call it in Indonesia, or sabu jagat in Bahasa Indonesia. This law regulates the electronic system, electronic transaction, digital signature, data protection, as well as cybercrime. Uh, the ample material it regulates has generated a number of problems in the level of implementation due to the multi-interpretation it is formulation. The major problem related to the implementation of cybercrime articles, for example, is the combining of both cyber dependent crime and the cyber enabled crime. The lowest positions, the social decency crime, defamation, violence, threat, and the hate speech as part of the cybercrime under the inadequate formulation. Consequently, in the practice, there are so many criminalization acts against the legitimate expression. We call this law as a retaliation instrument because it is easy to imprison the people having different opinion using this law. In fact, the using uh, the law is dire who are strong in political and economic power, while the victims are in the weaker positions. The another problems with the ITLO, uh, it is the authority from the government to conduct arbitrary blocking and filtering internet content without the due process and without the strong procedure refers to the human rights requirement in the limitation of rights because there is no detailed uh, mechanism to uh, conduct internet blocking or uh, internet uh, content filtering. The tendency of using authoritarian approach in creating the digital policy is the plan of Indonesian government in the formulation of cybersecurity and resilience law proposed by House of Representatives last year. Uh, the bill was rejected by public as the approach tended to be state-centric and give large authority to the cyber body or BSSN, we call it. Uh, such as uh, the authority includes the blocking of the internet content as a dangerous without the ad adequately defining the scope as well as the authority to monitor internet and data traffic uh, uh, similar with the cyber security law in Thailand and for the sake of defending the cyber security in the nation. The principles of multi-stakeholder governance in regulating internet are also less accommodated in the bill. In short, the bill works more on national security approach than human rights protection. Indonesia also has serious problem in protecting its citizens' privacy. Currently, Indonesia has not had comprehensive personal data protection law, and there is no law which clearly regulates in the limitation of lawful surveillance action by, uh, 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 conducted by the, uh, the, the, the government institution or uh, security institution. As a result, there are a lot of data mining practices particularly committed by the government with this regard, the principles of personal data protection. Uh, government is so proud and eager to use various technology, including the connectivity between administrative population database system and a number of visual monitor cameras equipped by the facial recognition technology. The connectivity is conducted to prevent crime, but in the fact, it is also used to conduct surveillance with the peaceful protest against government's policy happen. Doxing and surveillance practices against the activists who voice out their critics against government's policy also increased in these recent times. The preparatory rhyme uh, unknown with until now because uh, the accountable process of revelation is never done. Uh, the suspicion I am are at the state apparatus or uh, the state uh, or those sponsored by the state 
or we call buzzer in, in, in Indonesia, considering the increasing number of the cooperation between the government with the tech companies providing the surveillance technology. Further, in handling COVID-19, uh, specific with the management of the COVID-19, the government developed uh, the special application named Peduli Lindungi, or care and protect uh, in order to conduct tracking, tracing, and fencing, but there are still many problems regarding privacy in the use of this application, which increase the suspicion on the large-scale data mining in unlimited time. Uh, finally, as an update, currently, government and the House of Representatives uh, discuss the Personal Data Protection Bill, which will be passed in the end of this year. So maybe in the next two years, Indonesia will implement the, that, the new data protection law. And the next year, they will discuss of the cybersecurity bill and the communication interception bill. That's why the tension between security and civil liberties will be continuing in Indonesia. So uh, I think it is the short update from the Indonesian uh, currently, and I will uh, give the another perspective uh, in the uh, discussion session. Uh, thank you, uh, Debbie. Terima kasih, Wan Yudi. Uh, thank you for keeping it short and sweet. Um, it's always a pleasure when, as a human rights activist, you've been campaigning for the release of a political prisoner and the person gets released. But it's even a greater pre uh, pleasure and privilege when the released political prisoner, in this case, uh, surgeon and writer, Dr. Martida from Penn International is on your panel. So, Dr. Martida, after um, the so-called transition from a milita military dictatorship that jailed you as a political prisoner for five and a half years, has the situation improved? Where are we in terms of, have we swapped over a military dictatorship for a digital dictatorship? Uh, indeed, the, the most surprising thing is, you know, we already do have uh, defamation in our penal code, such and such. But after the transition from the military regime to the quasi civilian regime, now we have more than six laws, including the sessions on defamation. So, this is the big challenge for everybody right now, you know. Even for the pinnacle, the, after the, uh, taking power, the very first quasi uh, military uh, uh, government, it's put it one more section into uh, one article of the pinnacle. And it's saying, criticizing and uh, making the, the defaming any of the military officers will be sued. So because of this, there are so many cases happen right now, you know, so we now have uh, one of the sections in Electronic Transition Act, telecommunication law, news media law, laws protecting the privacy and security of the citizens, and the Counter-Terrorism Act. So, so and so, more and more law has been uh, included the uh, section for the defamation. So the easiest way to make someone who speak up to send to jail is file under the defamation law. These of six laws are ready now, you know. And uh, surprisingly, you know, the digital freedom, the digital platform, and these things are pretty much related. For example, like we do have a very strong tradition of uh, presenting. Uh, sort of uh, satirical poetry performance. It's we call Tanjad, especially during the New Year uh, Indian Water Festival. And every, since for so long, more than 100 years, we have been practicing this kind of satirical uh, both, uh, Tanjad performance, criticizing the government and others. And recently, uh, last year, it was a students' union group. They making this true and that true, and they having 
is not a, uh, it's a competition, you know. They need to move from one township to another in, during the daytime and performing. Uh, a full day, they have been performing from this township to another, going around. And they also live streaming their performance. And then they were sued under two defamation action, uh, two, uh, defamation law. One is in a code, is simply criticizing the army. Because of this, they were sued under 505A of the Pinnacle. And then, because of the live streaming, they also uh, filing under the defamation using the uh, digital platform. It's a telecommunication law. You know, they have been sentenced for five to six years already because of these two laws. So I think the big challenge for us right now in the quasi uh, civilian government is most of the uh, file defamation cases are filed by the military officers. Mainly, you know, before the, the, the telecommunication law, the famous 166E has been enacted in 2013, but uh, reviewed in, in 2017. So before 2017, everyone can sue, and if they file under the 166E, uh, uh, this one can be arrested anytime, no bill of something like that. And then after uh, 2017, the third person cannot fight the lawsuit. Only the one who ought to be the fame can sue something like that. So after 2017, most of the cases are mainly filed by the military officer. So this is the current situation. And another case I, I like to focus is the internet shutdown, of course. The same law, telecommunication law, section 77, it's kind of the uh, emergency situation. Uh, government can ask the, the, the internet provider and the, the, the regional government to shut down the internet. So using this, since 2019, June 21st, more than eight townships in the Rakhine State and Chin State had been under internet shutdown. They just lived for a couple of townships, but they reimpose it. But the final decision will be known tomorrow. You know, <laughs> according to their statement, it will finish tomorrow. So from tomorrow, they might change or they might extend or they might expand. That we really didn't yet know. So the problem is the target that the reasons they use is to control, to defend the national security because the very, very fierce fighting is going on between the state army and the Arakan army. Arakan army is mainly included the uh, Buddhist Rakhine people. So the, the state army and the Arakan army is fierce fighting to reduce the, the, the pace of the violence and the pace of the hate speech or other related issue. They impose it. That, that's their. Uh, excuse, but it's a blanket shutdown, so it's impact a lot, especially when the coronavirus issue come up, you know, there is no way for the victims and the big people from this region to learn about what's going on. So it's very, very hard, you know, because of these fierce fighting, a lot of people, a, a, a million people, has been under uh, refugee camps, internally displaced places. So we really want to help them, but there is no way. We really don't know where they are, how we can help them, something like that. So especially after the coronavirus cases, it sounds like very, very helpless for us. We really don't know how to educate them. And then the, the problem is, as you all know, the border uh, between uh, the East Rakhine State is very near to the Bangladesh and the India, and the cases in the Bangladesh and India is quite high. So we have so much concern about these two. And there are several other uh, laws, uh, for example, like the, the Peaceful Assembly and Peaceful uh, Procession Law. It's another uh, issue we are facing now. So that's why I just want to say uh, the overall situation right now in Myanmar regarding to uh, in terms of freedom of expression is in uh, quite critical still, even though they are the structure of the uh, 
the government has been a little bit changed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Matida. We've got only three minutes left. But before I invite Do uh, Dama Juniato, the, the Executive Director of SafeNet Indonesia, to, to just put in his two cents, two minutes worth, I just wanted to remind everybody that a lot of the background information, a lot of information resources are available to participants of RightsCon and people who uh, watch this session uh, through the RightsCon platform, but also uh, probably Manusha Foundation will make this package of information available on its website. So we've got two minutes left. Make it count. We have uh, Dama Junierto from SafeNet Indonesia to give his two minutes worth. Thank you. Uh, I will try to limit myself to respond only about the rise of internet shutdown in Southeast Asia region. So online censorship, cyber surveillance, and internet shutdowns are the key ingredient in the rising wave of digital uh, dictatorship. So in internet shutdown, as explained by Access Now, is the uh, disruption of the internet. But uh, only uh, they said online censorship, like blocking apps and websites, is also put the practice of internet, also put uh, decategorize uh, as a practice of internet shutdown. So so far, uh, keep it on coalition, where uh, SafeNet is par part of it. Uh, recorded two countries in the Southeast Asia, Myanmar, especially in the Chin and Rakhin State and also in Indonesia, especially in Papua and West Papua provinces. Uh, in Myanmar, internet shutdown happened more than two years until now. Uh, uh, the Myanmar government practiced internet shutdown based on the national security reason to control the population of Rohingya uh, people. Uh, on May 26, uh, 2020, the Keep It On Coalition uh, sent an open letter to uh, WHO uh, asking the government of Myanmar to uh, to stop the internet shutdown uh, because it's a COVID-19 pandemic. Well, in, in, in Indonesia, is uh, internet shutdown being used. Uh, I got a valid information based on the same reason uh, is uh, being used because of the national security reason rather than what so-called uh, the spreading of hoaxes. If the government said the, the reason of handling hoaxes, I will say, I, I said uh, internet shutdown is instant and easy and lazy way to solve the problem of hoaxes, which create uh, greater problems and undermine digital rights. Let me conclude the, my response to this. Uh, we need to aware that these techniques was a growing trend in the globe and the possibility that internet shutdown will be used also in this region. Meanwhile, we still have, we still have problems in uh, Myanmar and as well in Papua West and West Papua, although we already win the court, but uh, we just heard the news that the the some part of the in West Papua having a problem of the, uh, accessing the the internet, and then this is why uh, we have to stop the rise of digital censorship in the region. In the end of my response, one minute left. Uh, no, you're out of time. Okay, we have to. So fight we can't next. tell. We can't tell. Right, scorn to keep it on for this for this session. So we just got to keep on the fight. You got to keep resisting digital dictatorship. Subscribe to all the Twitter feeds. Come on to our website of all our organizations, and let's keep on working and resisting. Thank you, everyone for being part of this session. Thank you everyone for your contributions and um, let's keep keep fighting the good fight. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank you, Emily. Bye. Bye.